Welcome into the Trevor Stop Show, episode number 24. Today we have Robbie C. coming on as a guest. You're going to love Robbie. It's going to be a great interview. We're going to talk all about all the things he's doing with Disc Golf YouTube and just some other crazy random stuff. So just get prepared for a pretty wild ride. Uh, this is definitely one of the more entertaining interviews, I think. Uh, so I think you're going to enjoy it, but let's hop right into it. All right, we welcome in our guest for the show this week. We have Disc Golf YouTuber and Disc Golf Athlete important to mention um robbie c thanks so much for joining the show robbie dude honored to be here man it's uh i big time listener so very very honored to be among the huge list of studs and studettes that you've had already oh thank you so much i mean you were you were a must-have i mean i obviously knew quite a bit about you you know you're part of the foundation podcast network but then after the creators cup i was like gotta have gotta have you on the show for sure um, so, but to k- kind of get things started for those who aren't familiar with you, go ahead and give like your quick elevator pitch introduction as to what you do in the disc golf world. Yeah. So, uh, my goal in the disc golf world, I sort of, my like quick story is that I spent the first seven years that I played disc golf, not realizing you were allowed to change your form or your throw or like any of it. So I just ingrained some terrible habits, and I thought to myself, there are going to be new beginners coming into the game at all times, and I wanted to make sure that when new beginners stepped in, that not only were they not doing what I was doing, like if they were finding me, they obviously were already trying to improve and going on YouTube, but my goal was to make sure that more people fell in love with the sport and because we all enjoy things when we are better at them. So Mm -hmm. like... I wanted to make sure that people would have a better time out there on the course. And it didn't just have to be because we were talking about the biomechanics of your form and all that. I just wanted to make better golfers. So I always thought it was fascinating, like watching ball golf, how, yeah, like grandpas get out there and just obliterate me. Mm. But what what if we brought that to disc golf? So that's been my goal is to create better golfers one stroke at a time. Definitely. So you kind of like you mentioned, you know, your first disc golf specific video on your current channel was back in March of 2020. But you said you were playing quite a bit before that. How did you kind of stumble upon disc golf in the first place? So I'm a I come from an ultimate background. Uh, I started playing ultimate in like 2008, 2009, something like that. Um, and so I, yeah, I used to be, well, you talk about like a disc golf athlete. No, like I used to actually be athletic. And part of the reason why I went to disc golf is because you could be in way worse shape to play disc golf than ultimate. Those guys. Very true. Holy cow. Uh, also I'm pretty confident because of ultimate. I like my joints on my lower half are just shot. Uh, even at the ripe age of 30, like I have the lower half of like a 75 year old man. But Mm. I was an ultimate guy through and through. My brother, my oldest brother, moved to Indiana, and his church had a disc golf course, like, basically near it or attached to it or something like that. And he knew that I loved throwing Frisbees, and so he brought me up and was like, dude, we got to go play this disc golf thing. And I was like, yeah, this is so boring. Uh, Like, we're not running around. We're not doing any of this. So he handed me a Wraith was the first disc that I threw during that round, and I hated it. I thought it was like mm-hmm. so awful. So I just used an ultimate lid for the rest of the round. Came back to college. Uh, and that was 2012. So fall of 2012 came back. And all my friends were like, dude, guess what we picked up this summer? Disc golf. It's like ultimate, but we don't have to run. <laughs> I was just like, guys, come on. We're not disc golfers, man. Like, let's go to the quad. Let's throw the Frisbee around. Yeah. And so we just started playing disc golf, uh, and then we got hooked, started playing every day. And next thing you know, it was, yeah, like it just became a super big part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it it certainly happens quick. What, I mean, obviously you do like the instructional stuff now and you kind of mentioned your vision for that, but was the competitive side, what was able to kind of get you hooked in the first place? Was it sort of just the one to be competitive with your friends? Oh yeah. I mean, you, you get a bunch of college age guys in a room and it's, we're, we're, we're playing, you're in the middle of your round and you're like, bro, you're so trash. Like you cannot hit that putt. If you hit that putt, I'll buy you McDonald's on the way home. And then they hit the putt and you're just like, all right, I got to get it back from them somehow. How about if I beat you on the next five holes that you got to buy me McDonald's? And so yeah, the competitive side of it, I, I love competition and I've had to like try to rein it in, in my life of Mm. being overly competitive. Uh, 
But yeah, anytime, and I also when someone else like turns on that competitive vibe, all my self control leaves the like leaves immediately, <laughs> and I'm like, I guess we're getting this, we're keeping it for real right now. I gotta destroy yeah. this person. Yeah, I I totally get that. I I, I think I could tell from the creators games uh, or the creator cup rather that you kind of have that competitive level to you that you kind of try and tune out, albeit successfully. I think you've kind of learned how to do it because like. I actually was saying during one of the videos we filmed, like I could notice you like trying to like stay out of your own head with the competitiveness. And like I said to the camera at one point, I was like, I consider myself a competitive person, but I've never like, there are some people that just have that extra level to where like they need to, to like turn it off voluntarily or else they will just like slip into that and like get into super competitive mode. So I could definitely see that for sure. Yeah. I've ruined, um, I've ruined many a board game night because yeah. it's like, Oh, we're having so much fun. And I'm like, why the heck would you do that? That's the worst decision you can make. And then my yeah. wife like kind of just squeezes my leg real tight. And she's like, Hey, these are our friends, not enemies. Yeah, my bad guys my yeah. bad my bad yeah i mean hey when when you're in the game you know there are no friends so <laughs> obviously you know with disc golf you got into it you got hooked kind of like everybody's story recently you know you, you kind of some friends show it to you and then you know you can't go back from there but what led to you starting your youtube instructional channel you know taking it from just like a hobby or a competitive interest to hey i want to make content with this yeah so i uh I spent 10 years as a youth pastor. Um, mm -hmm. So basically I graduated high school immediately uh, started volunteering in a youth pastor role and then served in a full-time role. So I've always loved to teach. Uh, I think I'm like, it always feels like bold or cocky to say it, but I think I'm good at it uh, yeah, when sure. it comes to teaching. So I have loved to teach for a long time. In 2019, I uh, stopped working at a church full time. And so I didn't have like the weekly teaching outlet. And something that's always frustrated me about just kind of life in general is when people speak in terms that alienate others from like joining the conversation. So yeah. something I try to like be very cautious of whenever I'm doing videos or anything like that or having a conversation is make sure we're using the same terms. So in disc golf, we can say like Heiser and jump into that. But even like when I'm talking about it on the, in the bag podcast, I'll still, if I'm saying like Heiser, I'll be like, yeah, the outer edge is down. Uh, mm -hmm. and so trying to make sure that everyone knows kind of what we're talking about. And I'd watched a ton of in the bags and people were like, yeah, I use this for Heiser flips. And this is my turnover disc and this is slightly stable yeah. and all that. And I was like, yo, I have no idea if I was just tuning in what these mean. So I wanted to create the most basic sounding in the bag possible. Uh, so that like, if you, if you watched it, it probably, and it, when I go back and watch it, it's painful for me to watch because it's so bad. Uh, it's so poorly <laughs> shot. Audio quality is terrible, all that. But I got out there and was like, I want to make a video so that someone else can connect with it. And let's see if, let's see if it resonates. And that was kind of, I actually dropped it and then went on vacation and, uh, to Disney world. And that was, we got back from Disney world on Thursday and the world shut down because of COVID on oh, Saturday. Yeah. yeah. So it's so funny. I've heard a lot of people that had trips to Disney, like right as COVID was hitting <laughs> like a common destination that spring. Yeah, I, it was like, yeah, it's so weird because I just, I remember people talking about COVID and being like, oh yeah, I know, like, sure, that's a thing. Oh yeah. And then oh yeah. It hit. We were like, oh snap. Like, yeah, we definitely should have caught it. Uh <laughs> right. Yeah. I was working in college athletics at the time and we had a con we hosted a conference championship basketball game right at the end of February. So full stadium just like thousands and thousands of people. And then a few weeks later, we were supposed to ha have a softball tournament that I was going to be working. Uh, it was actually during spring break and it got canceled just like out of the blue. We we're like, Oh, this virus thing. And I was like, Hey, I'm going to get a spring break. And I never went back to school. I graduated <laughs> online. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's how it was for me. Um, but <laughs> Hey, I imagine, you know, at least for me, but I imagine for you, it definitely freed up a lot more time for you to pursue the disc golf content. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And that's like, 
I, I, I laugh because when I first started making the videos, it really was like a hobby thing. And I, I found myself getting irrationally angry at the weather because it would be like I couldn't film during the week because I had a full-time yeah. job. So yeah. then it was like, if I'm going to make a video, I have to record on the weekends. And it just felt like that. And I'm sure for all you weekend warriors listening, like it's always beautiful during the week when you can't play. Saturday oh, yeah. comes and it's storming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's how I felt about my channel. And I like I I remember in January of 2021, Jesse from Trash Panda texted me and was like, hey, can we get on the phone and talk? Yada, yada. So he Instagram messaged me. And he asked me, like, do you ever think you'll do this full time? And I was like, no. Like, I definitely am never going to yeah, do this full time. No, bro, yeah. it's, it's like a YouTube channel. Are you for real? I had like a thousand subscribers at the time. Uh, and then here we are a year and a half later. Been doing it full time that entire time. So uh, <laughs> it's just crazy. Yeah, it, it certainly I think everything snowballed for everyone within disc golf. You know, people who weren't working full time in it started working full time. Those who were working full time, their businesses grew and their channels grew. It was just a huge like head start jump for everybody. Essentially, it's funny you mentioned that in the bag video because one of the things I wanted to ask you, I, I watched it this morning. <laughs> I watched a lot of Robbie C this morning. Um, I and I was kind of curious. You know, it wasn't. It's not for a first disc golf video. Not bad at all. It's really not bad. Um, but was well, I thought your bag itself was kind of interesting, and I was curious. I have it all written down here. If you can guess how many of the molds that you can guess that were in your original bag, because I was thinking back on my original bag. Like I even have Instagram pictures. I think like way back of like I can see my bag, and I'm like thinking about what those discs were, and I don't even know them all anymore. It's really tough. So I was curious if you would know. So I've got them all written down here. We'll start. I can even, if you think it's, do you think it's gonna be really hard? Cause if it is, I can give you some hints. Uh, no, I mean, I think I can work my way up. Uh, so okay. putters at the time yeah. I was a madman. I was putting with star AVR threes. Uh, yep. because it, you know, like I'm not trying to spoil anything, but the bogey bro battle, one of the ones you shot while y'all were down here, that man made me think putting with premium plastic might be a thing. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be a thing. So star AVR threes. I think I had just f discovered the AVR X three uh, was in there. I had yep. like a Mandalorian dyed uh, yep. like pink is so good. Uh, that was my introduction to overstable putt approach discs. Um, so the AVR X three and then I don't think I had like a true throwing putter in you my had, bag. You had two other putters in your bag. Okay. Uh, star <laughs> AVR three. Do, 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 do. Well, the star. So you had two star AVR threes as your putting putters. Yeah. But then do you, are you, you had another one. Is that what you were mentioning? No. Oh, it was that <laughs> orange fanatic one. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And that then, was in there. there. And, and then, then I don't remember what the fourth, what the fifth one was. It was your XT Nova that you threw in. Through hammers with, interestingly enough, <laughs> bro. Uh, I expected you to pull that out and be like, "This is just like my dead straight approach." You're like, "Yeah, I throw this thing upside down." <laughs> I was like, "Oh, okay." Yeah, because it just slides right up to the basket. If they still made XT Novas that didn't shatter upon impact, I would throw mm -hmm. them. Uh, but I actually have ten that I use for field work now. Uh, okay. So, so onto the mids, you had five mids. Okay, so we had a Mako 3 uh, with yep. a shark die. My brother has that one now. Uh, we had we had an Emac Truth in the bag? Co incorrect. Oh, I hadn't discovered the truth yet because I think <laughs> I even shot it. One time I was like, if I, the Emac Truth ever leaves my bag, I'll be shocked. And I run for the Emac Truth now. So um, hot takes here. Uh, <laughs> uh, Cayman? Nope. <laughs> Close. <laughs> the gator then? Yeah, you had a gator. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, man. No, I'm shook. Because uh, I, don't, I don't even know if I'd like really spend a lot of time with Trilogy at that point. Like, you I don't had think a... I'd... I'll just fill in the rest for you. You had a, a stingray in there. Oh, yes. A lion. Interesting choice. And a two-time rock three, which... That one, that one hit me in my feelings a little bit because I it was a red Paul McBeth two time rock three and I had one that I had for a long long time before losing it. So that one, yeah. that one I felt that rock three. Um, I literally I played around and I said before I started the round, "Hey, 
I, this is the last round with this because I had just discovered like the collector's market and yeah. I was like, this is a, this is a valuable disc. So then sure enough, hole 16 yeeted it right into the water. Mm. Uh, and I was are, like, well, there we go. It's cause I said or, it was the last one. Are you, are you a big collector when it comes to discs? Are you, are you like a buy sell guy at all? Or are you just a throw it guy? Cause I'm like, if I get a rare disc, I take pleasure in throwing it because I just, I think it's funny to do it ironically. Yeah, I 100%. There's the only discs that I think I keep senti- like I keep them sentimentally. So, I watched that like Paul McBeth video where he talked about every putter that he's won like a big thing with yeah. or something. So, my first tournament win, I have that putter saved. Uh like my first ace is saved, stuff like that. But Okay. Pretty much anything else, yeah, like I I just don't buy di- like rare discs. If a disc costs more than $50, I'm probably not going to buy it. Yeah, because I want to throw it. Yeah, the only really the only stuff I get that's collectible is if I just happen to have it from a long time ago, or or I stumble upon something like randomly in a used section. That's that's about as collectible as it gets for me. For sure, um, we'll move on past the fairways and drivers. I won't make you. Uh, <laughs> stretch yeah, your I do mind still have that. a bunch of race in my bag, so that didn't change. Well, you only had one wraith in your bag back then. <sighs> <laughs> so that's why we're skipping on past that. I was just curious because I know I couldn't remember, but I want to move on to um, the Creators Cup because that was obviously, you know, if you haven't seen the Creators Cup on our channel yet, that's a good uh, way to see Robbie C's disc golf talent on full display. I don't even say that ironically because he was kind of kicking butt out there. But talk a little bit about your experience with the Creators Cup and mostly like your your expectations going in as far as the competition and then how happy you were with the results. Yeah. Uh, so going into it, I think, um, I, so I get the chance to compete in tournaments. I, I, it's a very important thing for me. If I'm going to be coaching people and how to play the game, I want to make sure that I am, I'm constantly field testing the stuff that I'm trying to teach. So I, I try to play, I think my goal is 25 tournaments a year, um, something along those lines. And those could be like flex starts or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I want to be, sh- I want to make sure I'm actively competing because I understand most of my audience isn't actively competing in tournaments, but I want to be able to connect with them, um, and have that. So going into it, I really wasn't worried about like, Oh, what's it going to feel like for a pressure putt? Because I feel those in multiple moments. I was a little like curious with a gallery because I've played in front of a couple galleries, but nothing crazy. But I also am like such a crowd pleaser at heart. I knew I could just like goof off and hide the fact of my disappointment if I was throwing bad shots. Um, So like that's a natural cover for it. But also when you're like laughing and goofing off, it also helps you um, stay loose. So, yeah, uh, yeah, I just, I was very going into it. I straight up didn't think I was going to make the finals uh, because I had played with David before uh, at the NADGT championships. So I knew David could ball. Uh, I knew y'all were going to show up in a major way. I knew Molt could play some serious golf. And so for Mm -hmm. me, the fourth spot was either overthrow or Danny. Yeah. So, yeah. like, it was, I had a long shot getting in there. I knew I was a good putter, so I thought I'd do pretty well there. And then the accuracy competition, I consider myself a very accurate player. So the mm-hmm. fact that I just was trash at the, the accuracy, accuracy competition, yeah. Uh, yeah, that was rough. Uh-huh. Well, talking about your putting, uh, you know, you have one of the most interesting approaches to putting in pressure situations. <laughs> Um, not only do you, so there's a few things that you do and th- that are unique. Number one, if you get stuck over a putt, you will take a dance break and go over to the side and start dancing. And number two, uh, you also smile at the basket before you putt. And then sometimes if the ex- situation gets too extreme, Katy Perry song comes out. So talk a little bit about that approach. Yeah. So it's levels, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm all about like positive, positive energy, positive thoughts when you're stepping up to a, um, space, like to a putt. So if at any point during a putt, if you're thinking to yourself, like, what if I miss this, you've brought negative 
like you've brought the ability to miss into play. So yeah. step off and literally leave the space. Mm-hmm. The dance break helps me because I like, for some reason, it's not unusual uh, by uh, like the Carlton. It's not unusual to be lonely. Yeah. Uh, that's the song that I play in my head every time that I step away. Okay. Because then I'm telling myself like, oh, it's not unusual to have bad thoughts about a putt. But what is unusual is the fact that you're about to bang this putt. And then I turn okay. around and I step back up. Uh, and then the, the smile is like, it's, it started off cheesy, but then it really did just like, it's really hard to smile intentionally and be yeah. sh- like stressed in your shoulders. Okay. Uh, because where I think a lot of putters and people, they get tight as they get tight in their shoulders. So then they have to use their arm and their hand more, which causes us to pull the disc a lot more than we should. Uh, that was something my coach worked with me on was I like was bringing my left arm back too much and it was putting tension in my shoulders, which was mm. causing me to miss more. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, all valid points. I think it's more, you know, I think if I had the guts to just start dancing in the middle of a round, then I think it would probably help anyone that, that can get out of their own head. Yeah. Um, it, it certainly worked. I mean, your putt was definitely on. Yeah. Uh, no, there was no doubt about the, that. The only issue, right, is that you can't do it every time because sometimes you got to like just mm. mentally reset anyways because we're not trying to go like full Gannon Burr or Nico and like get people to call time violations on you. Yeah. But I'll also say when I played the Music City Open, a literal pro tour, like a Silver Series, mm-hmm. I had Ben Calloway on my car, GT Hancock, and a local guy, Logan Bowers. Yeah. And I danced twice on that card, and at no point did either of them look at me and go like, Hey man, you're putting slow. Come off of it. So no, I'm just it saying, take like, you long. if people, really you long. if you're worried about your time violation and you want a little more time to think, just dance, and people will be so perplexed at the fact that you're dancing that they're probably not going to pay attention to the fact that you just took the full thirty seconds. It's a good point. It's a good point. I think honestly, for me, like I really only notice like thirty seconds when somebody is like practicing their putt over and over again. Yeah, I think the dance, the dance is just entertainment at that point. So yeah, That's what we're it worked here for. for me. Um, but I want to move a little bit back into your instructional content. Um, so disc golf instruction is kind of like this gray area where there are not a ton of objective things that we know about disc golf, you know, form strategy, this and that, you know, everything that we've kind of figured out, we've kind of figured out as a community and the pros can communicate what they've figured out through clinics and things like that. But for your instructional content, you, you have quite a bit of original, um, stuff, at least for my ears, like you've told me things that I hadn't heard before. Do you, um, do you take a lot of inspiration from certain places when you're designing this content or do you kind of, you just create them on your own? Are they more organic? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's a great, great question. So I, I honestly try to stay away from like the, the biomechanics and all of that, because I, I totally am with you that like, I don't think we have it all figured out yet. Uh, and I never want to like have to come back on something and say like, Oh, I put out this video and actually it was confusing or I pulled it down and there are channels that are really good at it. Um, Mm -hmm. who I think are taking the right steps and all that. Like Josh from overthrow does a really good job of whatever he's teaching in his lessons. That's usually what makes it to a video. Like if it comes up in lessons four times that week, you're probably going to see a video on it soon. Um, but for me, I watch a lot of Rick Shields from yeah. golf. Uh, mm-hmm. So I like how he approaches the game of golf is so fascinating to me. Um, and then there's another channel. I can't remember the name of it, but they like it's I think they're like from Taiwan or something like that. Uh, but they Ooh. are known for this, like the way of the playa, which was okay. where this like play for par mindset came out. Uh, okay. And so the more that I brought it over to disc golf, I just have realized people make this game way, way harder than it actually has to be. For sure. And yeah. like, I, I just, oh, it's, it's so fascinating to me. And like, they get stressed about it and all that. So what I, a lot of the content that I'm coming up with is just truly trying to say, I want to get in people's heads and I just ask a lot of questions. 
Why are yeah. you doing those the way you're doing? Why did you make that decision? Why did you make that decision? And I play with a lot of beginners. So I think some people have to play, like to play competitive golf, they have to be playing with good people. So they're pushed. But yeah. I always play with people that are beginners or are learning. So I've had to learn like how to push myself competitively. Yeah. Um, but because I'm playing with those beginners all the time, I'm always careful to be like, I'm not, I'm not going to coach you unless you want to be coached during this round. Right. Uh, right. But if you don't mind, I'm just going to ask a lot of questions that you can't give a wrong answer to. And that builds so much of my content. And then I have wow. a really, we've built the birdie fan, which is my little Patreon community. And the biggest benefit is it's getting all the right people in the room so we can learn together. So yeah. we just have a bunch of beginners in there and I don't promise that, you know, pay 30 bucks. You're going to be a better in 60 days or anything like that. I just want to make sure like get in the room with the right people. And if we're all asking the, the same questions, we're going to find the answers eventually. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good approach to it. Kind of just starting from the ground up and, you know, because I think a lot of disc golfers probably have, like we all share the same problems within our game. And, and I think, yeah, asking enough questions, you can kind of find the root source of all those things and then work from there. Cause I, I mean, you do, you definitely have a lot of content that talks about things that are, it's almost obvious, but you never think of it until you kind of bring it up and it's like, Oh yeah, that, that, you know, that is a smart way to approach. And I think you're building, you're definitely building a YouTube channel where the tips you're handing out are are almost like those guaranteed to shave strokes because a lot of them have to do with the little things, not some crazy, like you said, biomechanics, like you need to make this huge change. It's like, Hey, maybe you should start throwing this type of shot on the course more when you get to this distance, like, you know, stuff like that. That's, it's just so simple, but it's stuff that you don't really think about. So I, I totally get that. Um, one thing I was wondering is, you know, since I, I was, you know, anytime I can get somebody to a conversation with somebody who's in disc golf instruction in general is I would ask you, you're, you, you're assessing my game. Okay. Let's say, I mean, you see me play probably a, a little bit. Yeah. Um, what is the first thing you would tell me to do? If you were to try it, let's say, let's give you an objective and your objective would be to like shave an average of three to five strokes. So nothing crazy. Just like, what would you, what would you tell me? Uh, so I would say, um, I, I actually like your driving form a lot. Um, okay. I think that I don't like, hear that too often. That feels good. <laughs> uh, yeah. Like I think it, it, you, if you like, we're trying to think about, okay, this is what traditional like power distance form would look like. Obviously. I don't think if you're looking at yours, you're like, oh yeah, me and Gary Gurthy were throwing the exact same way. No. But it works for you. Uh, mm -hmm. You have consistent results, um, and you get really good distance. So I like. I actually. I think your T box. Your T box. I wouldn't start there. And I think the easy like, if we're talking about foundation in general, I feel like you guys live on the like we're not good putters vibe. Uh, yeah. And so it's easy for me to be like, oh yeah, be a better putter. But that doesn't work. Sure. Uh, so. Where I think the biggest gap in your in your game is uh, some backhand turnover approaches. It's truth right there. So what I would have you do is like I my coach called it the flick of the wrist, and I live by it. And it's that like that idea of playing catch while you're warming yeah. up uh, and finding that disc for you, and maybe it's this new slammer on its way, or a really beat in putter, or whatever it is. Um, play catch and warming up and just seeing how can I aggressively run the shot. Yeah. And then I also, the other thing is like, I don't know what you've got to tell yourself mentally to reset, but there are lots of times where I watch y'all putt in your video mm -hmm. and like, I can just see the terror of, <laughs> Oh yeah. Oh no. I'm about to miss this putt. We're about to make uh -huh. this whole reality of we can't putt go again. Um, so I just, I would tell you like all the confidence Connor's trying to give you behind a camera, embody it personally. And if you step up to a shot and you're or a putt and you're like, Hey, just try for like a couple rounds. If you yeah. think I'm going to miss back off, just literally back off and see if it works or not. Uh, and you don't have to dance. You don't have to do any of that. You could be dancing internally. Uh, it's fine. Yeah, no, completely valid points. And it's funny. You mentioned that, that kind of floaty backhand shot because I was, that is a gap in my game is like the ultimate players have a huge advantage in like the touchy shots. Yeah. Um, 
I when I got into disc golf, I was pretty young and I hadn't really had much experience throwing a Frisbee at all. So I kind of learned to throw a disc or a Frisbee with a power grip and snapping it really hard to get to throw it. So I never learned that touch kind of floaty backhand type throw. And I've tried to like slowly these days, like, I, I mean, I didn't fan grip. Fan gripping was not a part of my game until a few months ago. Probably yeah. I power gripped everything. Um, and that like touchy backhand floaty shot is something that I've never really had. And I've tried to program myself, but I have a lot of times I have too much wrist or, I, you know, and I don't really have the discs for it sometimes. So that is something that I'm trying to work on. But that brings me to my next point is I am jealous of your ability to throw the pole cat. Um, <laughs> You went, we went into the creators cup and I've had a, a longstanding, uh, rift with the pole cat on social media. Uh, and people know how I feel about the pole cat. And I told you how I felt about the pole cat. And then I watched you throw it and you throw really cool lines with it because it's that lid style disc. And like Garrett Gerthy does it with the Sonic. And it's such a cool shot where it's like an ultimate pass and you're throwing that floaty shot. So I'm going to give you a window here and, and you can give me your like hardest try at a polecat sales pitch right now. Okay. So, uh, three points that I'll attack with. I know when y'all show up to your videos, you don't warm up. Like that's not a thing. Never. So, uh, if you grab a polecat, you can get a quick warm up in. And while you're talking through, Hey, here's how we're going to shoot this. You can Mm -hmm. literally just be tossing the polecat back and forth. It's going okay. to teach you that touch shot. So, and then you're also actually going to be warmed up for your videos. So you're going to start playing better in all your videos rather than when y'all are playing uh, Lynchburg College and hole one steps up and you're like, first shot of the day, shank. God, we should be getting the birdie on this every day because yes. you were sitting there warming up with your pole cat. Boom. Point. All of a sudden, we're birdieing this. Uh, and it might even, I, I've, not, I've not played that one, but it might even be a pole cat shot. Uh, it could be. I'm just saying. It's a putter. So uh, flips up, it goes down there. Second thing, when a pole cat hits a tree, because it is like so round, you cannot yeah. get volatile tree kicks with a mm. pole cat. With a pole cat. So if you're ever worried about like any sort of touch up shot or anything like that, throw the pole cat and you know, hey, at worst, it's just going to drop in the middle of the fairway. Yeah. Easy peasy. Uh, and then finally, um, I would say the third one is that there is no disc that like, especially a DX pole cat. You don't have to get a halo pole cat. Halo pole cats are great. Obviously they, they get to that. They take longer to get into the perfect state, but they stay in it a long time. Yeah. But a DX pole cat gets beat in super quickly. And there is no disc that will teach you touch while also making it. So uh, there's a Paul Macbeth video where he's interviewed and he says from 75 feet and in, I just feel like I'm going to make it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is no disc that I've ever found that gives me that confidence like the polecat. Uh, I have had more throw-ins with a polecat from, I would say, 125 to 50 feet than any other disc that I've ever thrown, including picks. Because yeah. even you can be so aggressive in what everybody talks about the Berg... They're yeah. like, oh, yeah, you throw the bird, you just throw as hard as you want. Yeah, it, just, it doesn't go it anywhere. Sits. Yeah. yeah. The polecat is that, but it's actually controllable, unlike the bird, which is like sneaky overstable. Yeah, that's true. Okay. I mean, I think the thing about the polecat for me is like I am a sucker for I- ironic discs. And like the polecat has always been, even even in its realist situation where like it's actually useful, it's still ironic. It's always going to be. Um, so like it doesn't take a lot of convincing for me there. It's when I pick it up in my hands and I feel it. <laughs> That's when it gets me. It just doesn't feel comfortable to yeah. me. I like how do you hold a polecat? Are you, are you just like open fan gripping it? So and that's you, that's what I was going to say. Have one next to you is um, so people think like I'm fan gripping the polecat at all times. Yeah, I never fan grip my polecat. Oh, I'm always power gripping. You power grip it? Yeah. Oh so I power gosh. grip because this lid edge is so 
so obscenely weird uh, yeah. that like the fan grip, this is, the, and I have huge hands. So like, that's so uncomfortable for me to hold it like that. So I'm fan gripping and I'm literally thinking, take the back of my hand and throw it at the target, throw it at the target. Because that, you keep hand, elbow, hand above the elbow, uh, or wrist above the elbow, and you f- power grip, boom. Just kind of flick it out like yeah. that? Yeah, flick it out like that. And the best way to practice that is when you guys are doing a two- or three-minute warm-up, and you're just throwing play and catch to get loose, because you're going to practice that shot. And then other times, you're going to, like, for a flick, if you've ever flicked, uh, like, it's going to make you better when you go to a picnic and everybody's yes. throwing a frisbee around. Suddenly, you're gonna feel natural because you're like, "Oh yeah, I do this all the time with my pole cat." And, yeah. you're just, and then next thing you know, you're gonna be out the course. You're gonna be 75 feet away from the basket. You're gonna see that like turnover line, and you're gonna be like, "I threw this to Hunter when I was warming up." <sighs> Boom! I you're mean, in the chains. Admittedly, like this is all this is all attractive to me because I do have trauma for being at like the family gathering and like i'm supposed to be the one that can throw the frisbee really well because i do the disc golf thing right yeah, like yeah. and everybody in my family don't know what i actually do they're like oh yeah he's professional like whatever <laughs> but i'm not very good at it like i'll throw that first one and i've gotten better at it yeah. as i've learned a fan grip like i'm but i still have such a like a wristy motion in it and like i haven't figured out the nose up i guess like you were kind of pointing out yeah. to where it's just not very consistent and it, it traumatizes me. I, I don't like it. So that mode, that is a motivator. I, I think I'm going to have to try out that power grip technique on it because that's interesting to me. Yeah. And I, I will say because I have thrown a power grip for so long for even my upshots, I have gotten pretty good at throwing like as touchy of a power grip as you can. So yeah. I listen, I have a pull cat at home. I yeah. have one. Is I yours DX or DX or halo? I have a DX one, although Hunter has a Halo one, and he said he would give it to me, so I could get a Halo one. I was going to say because I have that package coming to you. If I need to put some goodies in there, I will. I let's you know I'm I'm not ready to take that step in 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 the polecat relationship yet. I, um, if you hey if you want a team stamp polecat, if that gives you more excited to throw it, oh, that's yeah, possible. I, I mean that's that's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure to be a part of this polecat cult because I also realize that it is it is that kind of group that like once i join there's no leaving you don't do that you can't you can't you can you can you hang out with other true, people Robbie. you know that's not true if i start throwing the pole cat I'm, you, because you like you have to double down on it because even if i'm terrible with it i have to convince people that it makes sense to be in my bag and that's what that's what's tough but, but you, gonna, i mean you said it the irony of when someone steps up they're like oh you throwing a pole cat on this and then you just lace a shot it's like Am I a polecat guy now? I I don't know. I'm gonna. I will give it. A, I will give it a try. I'll give it a try. I want to try and learn that shot, and we'll and we'll see what happens. Um, but moving on from that, another thing. I as I was going through your old videos, um, I saw one of your disc dying videos. Is one of your old videos as well? A disc dying tutorial. Uh, I'm a big like. I love disc dies. I love that you have a lot of custom dyed discs in your bag. So. Two part question. Number one, which which die of yours that you've ever done is your absolute favorite? And then number two, if you could choose a die to be on a disc in my bag at this moment, what would it be? Oh. Okay. Because I'll probably do it. Uh, I've, got I've got the itch to die discs. Okay. So my favorite die that I've ever done, uh, Favorite favorite personal die I've ever done is my brother has a Rock 3 that he loves. Like, absolutely loves it. And I did a stencil that. die of Dwayne the Rock Johnson Ooh. on his Rock 3. That's cool. So, I never thought of that. The Rock on a Rock. That's a yeah. great one. It was Rockception. So, <sighs> I uh, love that. So that one, that was pretty far up there. Uh, I I'm a big fan of that. So if you had to put one on your, uh, I, I want to lean into the Minnesota sports thing. Uh, you can, but well, no. let me, let, let me just put it this way. Let me, let me give you the opportunity. I, whatever you tell me, I will guarantee die on one of the discs in my current bag. So you can 
you can choose your own channel logo. You can advertise. I don't even no, care. No, I'm, I'm not here for that. I if <laughs> I, I, guys, I'm I'm such a bad YouTuber because I don't do the whole like. Make sure you hit like and subscribe at the end of the video. All that like, <laughs> it, if you guys want to hit the buttons, you can. Like that's great. But I whatever. Uh, if you yeah, I'm just here to try to spread some smiles. So uh, okay, okay. Here is one another die that I've seen done. Uh is someone did it for me before halo polecats existed yes i had someone on one of the ricky orbit felons die yes. the polecat symbol on an orbit mm. felon um, okay. so i don't know if you have any orbit stuff in your bag i have an orbit Saki slammer so that would be that would work yeah it's I, not, not no. quite the same it doesn't yeah. have the stripes in it but yeah uh here here's what uh Here's the die. I want you to, on a disc that you use often, Yeah. I just want you to die the word smile. Smile. Okay. Do smile in black and then go nuts with like a shaving cream bed or like, a, like all the cool swirls and all that. And okay. that way, when you're like, you just set that in the bag and when you're like, oh man, I'm going to miss this putt. Uh, you just think. Nope, I have this. I like. I have smile. Uh, okay. And you can take it a twisted direction if you want. You could do like the Joker. Let's put a smile on that face. That would uh, just scare like, me, honestly. Yeah. No. Let, whatever. Whatever. Ronald McDonald. Whatever you want to take with it, but something okay. to encourage you to smile. That's what. That's what I want to see. I want to see Foundation start banging some putts like Hunter was doing all over my face uh, <laughs> at the Creators Cup but not because we're in the middle of a serious competition. Like, okay. Yeah. That's my, that's my heart for you. Uh, okay. well, well that's, you know what? That's great. And you know, I do need to smile more on the disc golf course. So <laughs> that, that can't hurt to have that reminder in my bag. Maybe I'll, I'll put it on a disc that I use a lot. And then sometimes when I throw it, I probably need to smile after because it doesn't work out so well. Yeah. I have a lot yeah. of, I have a lot of discs like that that are like guilty pleasure discs. Do you have any guilty pleasure discs where like, you know, you probably shouldn't have it in your bag or continue throwing it and you just do it anyways. For like sure. Like Polecat. Uh, <laughs> whoa, 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 <laughs> whoa. Uh, no, it's new Eagles for me. Uh, when I put a new They're eagle so in my stable. bag, yeah, it's <laughs> oh like, I love a beat in eagle, but the yeah. process of getting it there is like, I just have to suffer through it for it's several pain. holes. It is pain. I have a new eagle in my bag right now and I've embraced it because I do have a T bird behind it that doesn't flip, but it's taken me weeks of throwing it and watching it fade dramatically on me before I'm like, Oh yeah, this is almost a firebird. It's a very stable 12 time. Yeah. So that that's honestly that is a very relatable moment right there. Um, okay, so we're gonna step away from disc golf. Okay. We're gonna go. We're gonna go into personal slash interest segment. Game time. Yeah. First question, and then you've probably gotten this a bunch, but I notice you the keys you wear around your neck. Yeah. I've seen you wear them in like a ton of videos. You've been wearing forever. Is there like a sentimental meaning behind them, or are they purely for style, or what's the story behind the keys? Yeah, so if you actually watch my older videos, every time that my... I've worn these keys every day since seventh grade. Uh, some of, well, wow. Some of them. Uh, so if you go back and watch my videos, any time that I'm putting and my left hand comes up to my chest, it's because my keys used to flop around a lot under my shirt. And so I would oh, okay. literally like hold them still. Uh, so that's what my left hand was doing in the old videos. Now I just don't care. They just do whatever. Um, so in seventh grade, I got uh, this key at a youth conference uh, and the, the speaker said that your life is an uncut key. Every decision yeah. you make in life puts a cut in your key so that you can open some doors and not others. Uh, and I have a whole video that I'm coming out with this because like, I thought it'd be a really cool, like another little memento people can put on their bag. Like every decision you make on the course puts a cut in your key. Um, That's cool. So that yeah. You can score some ways and not others. Uh, it's this, you know, like if we ever do a stamp together, the Robbie C and foundation stamp, I have this like cool vision in mind. Like I'll, I'll have design? to get with Hunter. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it's, uh, it could be sick. Y'all let us know in the comments if that's something you're interested yeah, in. Yeah. I like, that. um, and then this guy, uh, one of my best friends got me, uh, have you seen the movie Braveheart? Yes. So William Wallace's big sword. Uh, I have like a mini replica of that. And for my 18th birthday, um, 
uh, one of my best friends got me a replica of that sword and it's locked in a box. So this is my reminder to be brave. Uh, and then when I got ordained in the ministry, like I said, this I wore every day in seventh grade and then it's just gotten friends over time. Uh, okay. And then when I got ordained into ministry, my senior pastor, I asked him to pray over uh, the key that would unlock future ministry. Uh, and so, so you've just been adding keys. Yeah. So That's I cool. it it takes it takes something like it's a big event. Like when we got yeah. married, my wife got me a key that had yeah. our like anniversary date engraved on it. She was like, "Oh, you can put it on your necklace." And I was like, "Nah, that would be too much." Uh, I'm like, yeah. It was also this huge key, so uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, "Nah, keep that one safe." Yeah, that that's 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 cool. I was always curious about them. That's a really cool way to like keep those mementos and also add on. And also, I do agree that could be a very marketable stamp. So, you know, let's talk business about. Yes, that. sir. Yes, sir. Um, so another thing I noticed, and I you have a lot of board games. I see them in the background of a lot of your videos. I know you're a board game fanatic. I like board games. I grew up in a family that played a lot of games competitively. Uh, we had a shelf full of them, but I would I would not I would not consider myself like a board game like fanatic. Somebody who's like super in the know of them. Yeah. Um, pretty big Catan guy though. I will say that I am a pretty big Catan guy. Come on. But so, what are the most? I don't want to know necessarily your favorites, but what are the most overrated, or we'll just say the most overrated board game and the most underrated board game? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to, I'm going to instantly offend you so we can move past it. Uh, is Catan going to be the most overrated? I think Catan is the most overrated board game. Uh, if I, like when I describe Catan, I describe Catan yeah. as an end of a starter set. Mm. Into board games, you're saying? Yeah. I, I get that. I, I mean, I'm not in the board game community, so I don't hear like the chirp about Catan, but the glimpse of the Catan community that I've seen, I can totally believe that. So I'm not offended. Yeah. And if you take Catan at its base level, overrated. When you start adding cities and knights and yes, I've seafarers played all the expansions. and all that, yeah, makes the game way more interesting. I'm here very for that. true, um, very true. So I think that is, I think that's for sure. Fun fact: uh, Robbie C. Disc Golf almost didn't exist. It was a literal coin flip on whether I was going to start a board gaming video, uh, board gaming mm -hmm. channel, or a disc golf channel, uh, and. Literally, was, the coin yeah. landed on disc golf, and so we made that video. Was it an actual coin flip? It was an actual coin oh, flip. literal uh, coin flip. Was yeah. it he heads or tails? Heads. Because uh, wow. tails always fails. Uh, Oof. See, I'm a tails never fails guy, but I, at that's least okay. it, wor that's... it worked out for you in this case. You yeah, right. Here we are. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah, so I've always thought, like, if I can hire an editor uh, to start editing my disc golf stuff, then 100% the board game channel will probably show up at some point in my life. Um, okay. But yeah, so I overrated Catan. We'll just put that there uh, because lots of people come up, especially when they're trying to get into board games and they'll see my yeah. collection and they're like, yo, Robbie, I'm a big board gamer. You ever heard of uh, Settlers? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, of course I have. I have. Yeah. I own it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like to give you a glimpse in our collection, like we own, we own Catan. It is literally still in the wrapper. Oh, okay. like we haven't even punched out the tiles or anything in ours. Yeah. Um, it's just like a, you got to have it type thing. Yeah. If someone came over one day and they begged me to play Catan, we'd probably play Catan. Uh, yeah. But I'm also like, just, just like there's a disc for everybody that really fits their game. To me, there's a board game for everybody that fits their mm -hmm. game. Uh, underrated. So I think it's a target exclusive game, but we play okay. this more than anything else. It's the Super Mario Bros card game interesting choice i it's it's so good um it is okay. it's something like here's how easy this game is to play you guys could have it at the office and like hey we're headed out to weekly whoever loses has to drive or whatever it takes you like once you know how to play less than five to ten minutes to play oh, okay. a full round super simple it's like war yeah. meets a board game meets Super Mario Bros. Like it's it's very simple. I think okay. it's like fifteen bucks. Uh it's it gets played more than anything else in our collection. Interesting answer. And Not honestly, that very intriguing answer too. I think I'm gonna have to check that out. Uh because I yeah, I've played I played my share of car I played my a lot of war growing up, so you know, you got me there. Yeah. The the simplest of all games. But uh 
another thing I noticed when looking at your game bookshelf in the background of many of your videos is you've got some Harry Potter paraphernalia going on. Uh, I also saw a very old Instagram picture of you dressed in Harry Potter robes. Yes, sir. So anytime, you know, anytime I get to talk to somebody who is, you know, also uh, a Potter head, as we'll say, hey, uh, hey, you know, I, I've got to ask and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and presume that you've read the books. That's important. Yes, sir. Thank yes, sir. Goodness. My okay. wife is a children's librarian. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, so lots of the Harry Potter stuff is her. I think we own eight or nine copies of the first book. Wow. Okay. Wow. Special editions and all that. But like, yeah. What so house I, are you at? I'm a Gryffindor. Okay. I shan't, I'm not, I, I shouldn't say ashamed to say it, but you oh. know, it's boring. Right, what, are, what how, Well, my next question was, what house are you in? What house What house do you think I'm in? I'm not going to be I offended. I think you're in Ravenclaw. Ooh, you, that's a you good... You teach disc golf. You know, it's intellectual. That's a good shout. My wife is a Ravenclaw. I am uh, the best house. Hufflepuff. Oh, you're Slytherin. Slytherin all day, baby. I describe Slytherin as Gryffindors that want to win. That's funny because I think in the books, the Gryffindors usually win, don't they? They do. It's just they get all, you know, they get all the like, someone's got to be the bad guy. I root for the villains in literally everything in my life. Like, really? And uh, that, have you heard that like theory that Peter Pan is actually the villain in the Peter Pan movies? Um, no. So the, the, the theory is that Peter Pan is the villain and he actually kidnaps and like keeps the Lost Boys hostage. And Captain Hook is a lost boy that escaped from Neverland and came back to try to free the rest of the lost boys. Hmm. I think like, there's probably there's probably some movie dialogue that contradicts that, but yeah, I, but I, I like, like it. I, I'm team I'm team Scar in Lion King. I'm team Captain Hook. Like I is there the a Sith? line like do you draw like the Sith like they they murder younglings. I you know what like everybody makes <laughs> mistakes. Uh, <laughs> Everybody has those days. <laughs> okay. All right. So, I mean, now all, my, all that's happening now is movies are just going through my head of like, so you've, have you watched the Rocky movies? Oh, yeah. And yeah. you want him Drake. to lose. Yeah, Draco all day. Uh, Drago, you mean? Drago, Drago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah we're away from Harry Potter now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> my bad, my bad. Yeah, no. Like, the first one, like, I. that's why I love the first, the first Rocky. Because uh, he doesn't win. Because he loses. Yeah, 100%. That's got to be the most fascinating thing I've ever heard about you. I mean, that's the the legend goes on yeah. at that Infinity point. War, my yeah. favorite, my favorite Marvel movie, and it's not even close because it ends with them losing. Yeah, like now we just have I to sit in that. I res no, and I I agree with like I respect movies that do things like that. However, I'm not going to say I'm rooting for the villain. That I mean that no. man. <laughs> I would get a Death Eaters tattoo before I got. Any other Harry Potter tattoo, like the skull far. with the snake? Yeah, you should do it. I, I've I've thought about what. <laughs> once you get your first tattoo, it's like I'll get anything. I don't care. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I already have my first tattoo, so it's like yeah, cool. I get the Death Eater tattoo, sure. Man, right well, on Friday night, right? Un unbelievable. Well, that yeah, I mean. Well, I, mean, I think that's a good way to wrap up this interview. I mean, that, that's yeah. that's fascinating. We try to be a nice guy, but you got to root for the villain sometimes. So that that is so funny. Um. Well, anyways, uh, hopefully you've enjoyed this interview with Robbie. See, this has been more of a conversation because Robbie and I, you know, we're like best friends. Yeah. So that's what we do. We, you know, it's it's a little less like I'm super nervous and more so like I'm just excited and we're just talking about stuff. Uh, but if you enjoy more of these conversational interviews, because some of my other ones are that way, then make sure to let me know. Or if you're like, I hate that, never do it again, then tell me that too. And, and I won't. And Robbie will never come back. But It was uh, nice while it lasted, huh? Yeah. Anyways, if you haven't checked out Robbie yet on YouTube or Instagram or Patreon or anything like that, go ahead and search Robbie C. Disc Golf on those platforms and you'll probably find him. And he's got very good instructional content. And in, I watched a bunch of it this morning before this interview and – I'd already seen a lot of it and I have a good time every time. So if Appreciate you like, that. if you like camera transitions where he's like far away and then all of a sudden he's like really close, then you're going to love Robbie C. Yeah. If you don't like that, then don't watch. Uh, <laughs> it's it's going to be rough for you. Uh. Yeah, but you definitely should check it out. And uh, thanks again, Robbie, for joining my show. Uh, I know you're going to be on the uh, in the bag podcast uh, later this afternoon. So you're, you're pulling the double shift. So I appreciate it. 
Hi, hey, absolutely. Always a joy. Thanks for uh, glad to be part of the Foundation Podcast Network. Definitely check out all the other amazing podcasts we have on here. Uh, but Trevor Stop Show number one. Let's get it done. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna make that a t-shirt. All right, and thanks once again to Robbie for joining the show. I hope you enjoyed that interview. Uh, kind of got a little looser with it. Talked about some more like off-topic disc golf stuff. Let me know in the comments if that's something you like seeing, and I can translate to more of my interviews in the future. And any other feedback you have, I'd always appreciate it. I'm, I'm looking to kind of tune this show uh, in a way that the audience wants to consume it. So make sure you'll be back here next Thursday, though, for another great guest, and we'll see you then.